back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. I'm Julia Patrick. I'm here with Robert Stack, President and CEO of Community Options. And I think he's going to share with us a lot of options when we talk about disability advocacy and just general mindset that the nonprofit sector can communicate out. Um, Robert, welcome. It's really an honor to have you on our program today. Thank you. I greatly appreciate being invited. You know, I don't use the word national pioneer and trailblazer very often. We've interviewed uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. We've produced over uh, 1,100 shows, five years. Um, this is a really interesting conversation for us to have with you because I think you can bring with us a tremendous amount of perspective, and I'm really welcoming this discussion. So. I'm so delighted that you are here with us today. Before we get going, I want to make sure that we also promote and delight with the sponsorship that we have. Um, and this comes from Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that support us day in and day out. We also have an amazing co-host panel. We've been introducing them over the last couple of months. I hope you've gotten to know them. They come from all over the country. They're incredibly diverse in their work, thought, action, and deeds. And I'm flying solo today, but uh, they are amazing, amazing folks. Okay, Robert Stack, President and CEO of Community Options. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Where are you coming to us today from? Right now I'm in Princeton, New Jersey. Amazing. And that's where your offices are? Yes, our national headquarters is in Princeton and it has been here for quite some time. Wow. And you travel, I would imagine, because of your network and your work, you're probably um, traveling throughout the country quite a bit, right? I am constantly in the air. Uh, I, I I think the, the scariest day was when I got on a plane and the flight attendant asked me if I wanted the usual. Oh, <laughs> good and bad, good and bad. Yeah, I know. It, it's, it's a tough thing. And uh, that's a part of leadership now, too. You know, you can't just sit in your office and wait for things to happen. You got to get out there and do. Well, before we get into this too much further, and I have so many questions for you. So um, I'm going to be just barraging you with questions. Fair warning. Talk to us about what community options is and what you do, and then we're going to get into your personal journey. Okay. Community Options is a national nonprofit organization. Uh, we founded it in 1989. The mission is to develop housing and employment for people with disabilities. So we started, uh, what happened was we, we saw a need for this because there were so many thousands and thousands of people with disabilities living in institutions and um, living with mom and dad, and now mom and dad are getting older. They're no longer able to care for them. And uh, they didn't know where to turn and, and what to do. And there's uh, there's a lot of uh, similar agencies that are nonprofit like community options. Uh, our difference is that um, we're not a separately incorporated entity uh, where there's hundreds of separate, you know, um, Easter seals or whatever. We're just one entity called community options. So we, we saw this need and, uh, and we were able to open up our first, and what we do is we'll buy a home, small home, and, <clears throat> and we'll, uh, we'll find people that are in need of housing, either because of they, their family can't take care of them anymore, or they're going to, uh, be emancipated from a large congregate institution where they've been placed years before. And we'll put them in a small house, uh, maybe a four bedroom house, and they'll each have their own bedroom and we'll hire staff uh, bef and train them before they're placed. And then whenever they live in that small house, they'll, they'll learn or, or they'll sharpen their skills on cooking and cleaning and, and handling that house just like anyone else would. And then they would do what <clears throat> all of us do. They'll get up and they'll go to work or they'll go to a program and uh, they'll enjoy life uh, just like uh, any other American. Amazing. Okay. So thank you for painting that picture, because that's something that is going to frame up a lot of the things that we talk about. 
I would love to start with what your personal journey has been in advocacy, because reading your bio on your site, which is quite extensive, um, brought back some memories of language, our attitudes um, about disability that were more familiar to me growing up. So I, I kind of was thinking we've come a long way, but I'm wondering if you think we've come a long way and how has your journey shaped that? Thank you. I Well, you know, I do think, I think we've made tremendous progress, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, yeah. I always remark at the fact that, you know, the, 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 the space Hubble telescope was flying all over in space long before people with disabilities were emancipated from any institutions. Certainly that the Civil Rights Act in the 60s were really important and wonderful, but people with disabilities weren't part of that, 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 that Civil Rights Act. That, the, that there are a tremendous amount of, of strides have been made, but uh, there's still a long way to go. Um, and, and, and as you said, the vernacular has changed dramatically. Um, <clears throat> we used to use words like the, the disabled. Uh, even uh, people always, even, even today, you can still pull up to so certain uh, uh, parking lots and it says handicap parking. Right. And, and handy, where does the, I'm really not sure. There's been a lot of speculation about the etymology of the word. Yeah. Cap in your hand, Cap beggar. Cap in your hand for money. Yeah. So yeah. we, yeah, but I don't know if that's true or not, but I don't that, know. that's one of the things we, we've heard, but we, we don't use that. And just as though, you know, we don't like to, to be given labels. Uh, we want to be people first mm -hmm. and people with disabilities want to be people first. And because of that, that's what that's what we call them. We call them people, people, per, a person with a disability or a person who's from Arizona or a person who's from, you know, Chicago or a person who's from Florida. So they're people first. Uh, and, 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 and that that has changed. The, the other thing is uh, that that we've looked at is differently with with words are special, um, special. Uh, we, I like to say that special should be used uh, only to refer to things on sale or a <laughs> Uh, like a special occasion would be good, but <laughs> but special. Uh, the people don't want to be a special person taking the special bus to the special school because yeah. they get special ed from the special ed teacher. <clears throat> the the other thing we we felt that t people with disabilities want to go to class just like anybody else. They want they don't want to be segregated uh, in a special school. Uh, they want to go to a regular school like everyone else, and they want to teach and the teacher should be taught, you know, uh, various curricula uh, that, that would be reflective of, of a lot of educational aspects, but also special shouldn't be a segregated entity that's just a specialty, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that we look at. And when I was growing up, I worked with people with disabilities. As a child, I was uh, in a seminary. I, I left the seminary and I, um, I noticed that uh, the, the place that I worked at had closed. And it closed because uh, the, it was a nonprofit, but the, the, the people who were managing it didn't really know what they were doing. And it became obvious to me that people with disabilities rely a lot on, on uh, the, the good graces of charity. And I, I think that we're trying to get out of that methodology as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and we think people should work just like, you know, we all work for money, but we all work for, to do things that we like to do. And, you know, something I've realized is that there's a direct relationship between the severity of your disability and your level of loneliness. And mm. you have people that you can interact with, if you have people that you can work with, if you have people that you can share your experiences with or what you did the night before or yeah. what your aspirations are and enjoy life, you will live longer, your quality of life will be better and you'll feel good about everything that goes on. So it's a definite uh, enhancer uh, to, 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 your, to your own life. And it increases your lifespan. I, I'm, I'm only speaking anecdotally, of course, but that's that's been our feeling all along. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because um, think about just the Sur Surgeon General of the United States. Um, so many healthcare providers and people, you know, in science talking about this epidemic of loneliness and the mental health issue that we kind of forget about and we uh, don't ascribe it to purpose and work and work environment until it's too late or it's negative, right? And so I think that's an interesting thing to talk about uh, and, and to recognize um, 
in in the in the scope of this type of work this kind of takes me back to your foundation in 1989 when community option opens which is pretty astonishing to think about <laughs> I'll, I'll lay it out here you know you opened last century <laughs> and you're like oh no am i you know don't say it but i mean this is really a trajectory that's amazing because of all the things that you've gone through and seen culturally politically economically um what was it like when you first opened i mean were people like huh what are you doing you know i mean you probably had a pretty big chasm to jump over to even communicate what you were doing right yes it was it was extremely challenging to say the least uh, i worked in the, you know the, there i you had to work for, i worked from home because i didn't have a choice and i had no place to go i had no office at all uh, and I would, was constantly sitting there typing uh, what my bylaws were going to be and what my articles of incorporation were going to be and how I was setting everything up. And I was very, very lonely. And, 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 and uh, Skype didn't exist and Zoom didn't exist. And when the FedEx guy came, I'd be like, hey, you want a cup of coffee? Come on in. And they'd be like, get away from me. you know. But I was so, <laughs> so upset and lonely that I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Uh, it was also challenging because I, had, uh, I lacked one major resource, and that was money. So having no money definitely puts a cramp in your vision. Um, and so I had to really figure out ways to overcome that, 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 that enigma. And uh, the way that we, I did it was I, you know, I mortgaged my house. I took every loan I possibly could out on every credit card that you could imagine. And I, I, and my first, I, and I hired my first group of people. I, I bought my first three houses with absolutely on a total shoestring. And it was it was very 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 challenging. How did you articulate to your community uh, stakeholders? I mean, everybody that you were doing this at that time, because talk about trailblazing. You couldn't like point to something down the street and saying that's what we're going to do, right? I mean, you probably had to paint a, a total fresh picture for everybody. Yeah, it was uh, it was a, it was very difficult. But I, I mean, I did, and I, I just explained the same thing I keep saying now. I'm, I'm, the, the funny part is, when I started Community Options, as I said in the beginning, our mission is to develop housing and employment for people with disabilities. I came up with the idea because uh, from IBM, because IBM says, we make business machines. And I realized that we had to keep the mi mission and the method and what we were trying to communicate very simple to the public. We didn't want to get real flowery and real, real overly communicative where no one would really remember what we do. But to say we were going to find people houses and jobs, that was a pretty simple idea. Mm -hmm. And for people with disabilities to, to have that as an option was a very, very, very wonderful thing for parents and families who had historically not been exposed to that kind of, of thing. And we've taken, I mean, we've, and by taking people with disabilities and giving and finding them jobs and finding them places to live, their world changed so dramatically. Their, their, their lifestyle got better. They literally learned they, their, their, if they had any sort of um, negative kinds of behavior that seemed to diminish and, uh, and they seemed to have a, feel like there was a meaning that they had to life. Um, I, I can remember that one of the first people I met in an institution, his name was Bernard. And I said, Bernard, what do you do? He said, well, I put, I put these plastic uh, 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 pens and, that are different colors into a bag. And then I put that bag into a bigger bag. And then I put that bag into a box. And then after I do all that, I dump it out and do it again. Ridiculous, isn't it? And he laughed. Yeah. Now Bernard was blind and Bernard Bernard was blinded. Bernard had intellectual disabilities, but he knew that what he was doing was meaningless. Yeah. So, that, yeah. So I, I said, what do you like to do? And he said, well, I can answer the phone. I can talk to people. So I got, we got him a job as a receptionist. And he's been, he was, he's been a receptionist since the founding of the organization almost for over 25 years. He's Bernard but, but, but did something I'm not doing, which is he retired. Uh, he has his own condo. He pays his own taxes. He, we give him support. We help him with checkbooks, et cetera. He has a, he has a machine that reads the news. To him. But uh, he lives a life that's much more intriguing and much more interesting than he ever had before living in an institution. And I said, what did you hate the most about institutions? 
And he said, well, Robert, that you had to take ice cold showers and with yeah. a lot of other people. Yeah. yeah. He, and, and I said, well, what do you, what, what he said, now I can watch TV, listen to TV as long as I want. And no one tells me when to go to bed because he has to decide because he has to get up and, and, and take the bus to go to work. Mm-hmm. Now, the funny part about this whole story, he, the bus one time dropped him off and they dropped him off at the wrong condo. Mm-hmm. So oh. he, knocked, he knocked on the door and an older woman answered the door and she said, what are you doing here? And he goes, what are you doing in my condo? And she said, this is my condo. The, 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 the short end of that story is they have lunch once a month. Wow. So wow. yes, yeah, so it forced a totally different relationship because he would never have had a happenstance, serendipitous thing like that. No, you know, it's interesting because you talk about this institutional warehousing and then you talk about the group homes. And when we were, you and I were chatting in the green room, um, you know, there, there's a huge segment of our professional population in social services in in programming um, in college that have no idea about institutional warehousing that didn't exist. I mean, but, you know, I'm assuming, assuming you and I are a similar age and I can remember, you know, driving in my community and there were institutions, right? I mean, you would see them and you knew that's, you know, you didn't really know, but you, you, you intuited even as a child that this was a grim place, right? Um, Now group homes, they can be in your neighborhood and you have no idea, right? Um, talk about that link and, and what you all have been doing with that. Well, I, I always like to say that one of the things we try to do is have invisible programs. I don't want you to drive by and say, that's where they live. Or yeah. our, our vans don't have logos. Our houses are look just like everyone else's. We yeah. keep our lawn just as good as everybody else. Mm-hmm. We do the maintenance work and we do all of that stuff. And the staff that we hire, we train very well. So they're working in the house to make sure that everything's being taken care of. So, and right now uh, there's, there's about 17 to 20,000 people still living in institutions. And wow. there's a lot of people, what they've done now is kind of a, a, a convenient uh, way of dealing with the, the waiting list problems is they're unfortunately putting young people and people that are in their 20s and in their teens in nursing homes. And uh, that's another uh, camouflage way of dealing with uh, what they think is alleviating problems and having people live in the community when they're really living in a nursing home. So we're taking people out of the nursing homes as well. And then, of course, we talk to the families saying, you can avoid this as a step and we can take them right from your from when you when you need the service we, we can provide that service uh from when when you you can't provide services for your own loved one wow you know um, i'm thinking about just the educational aspect of what you have to do in terms of just getting everybody up to speed from the nomenclature to the mentality the mindset um, the journey of of this whole process, it's got to be uh, somewhat exhausting and somewhat foundational to the work that you have to do, right? I mean, are you finding that your teams are having to educate and get everybody up to speed before then they can even enact their work? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. Uh, the, the, the most important aspect of anybody that we hire to do the staff work is that they have to have a very, very, very strong ability for common sense and (laughs) and treat everyone like they want to be treated and what we do we have this very complicated way of educating the community do we send them brochures no do we do you know major campaigns no what we do is we invite them over to have a barbecue we can come on over we're gonna have a barbecue this sunday come on over to our small house and uh and we'll we'll cook up some some fish or some 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 burgers and you can come and meet the people who are your neighbors. Mm-hmm. And we found that that's the best way of diffusing any kind of uh, misconceptions that people have. We also think that, you know, again, the true enemy that we've always had in developing programs in the community is ignorance. And as long as yeah. we can educate the public that we, that we we're just like anybody else, we, yeah. we, we love, we, 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 we want jobs 
and we we, we want to respect and we'll give you the same respect that you give us and as long as we can do that we feel that uh, people with disabilities uh, can live a much much better life and the community accepts them much yeah. much more well can i and it, it reduces the fear you know the fear of the other the otherness that we we see it plagues society over and over again and i don't know why it's such a hard lesson for us to learn okay now this is the part of the show where i ask you to get out your crystal ball and polish it up <laughs> because what do you see as the future and when we talk about disability advocacy and and just moving forward in a better stronger way what do you see well let's just look for a second at the demographics here what the, the secret is that the baby boomers are getting older. That's a fact. And the baby boomers are going to need stuff. Now, what has historically happened with people with disabilities relative to work was they were pretty much exploited in the sense that they put they were put in a workshop where they, you know, put, you know, nails into bags or they did they 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 did little kinds of basket weaving, if you will, activities. Mm -hmm. What the United States has figured out is they can exploit that labor in third world countries. True. And they do that. Also, we know that, you know, you can do at the snap of a button, somebody from 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 from, from uh, Vietnam can answer your phone and, and be the receptionist. However, we still need somebody to carry our luggage up the stairs. We still need somebody to, to clean our office. We still need somebody who can help us uh, change the tire on our car. We still need somebody who can help us with that, uh, install that, that, that complicated computer chip that we haven't figured out how to put where it is. And when we look at those kinds of elements, the people with disabilities will be those people. Because let's face it, right now, we're in a crisis relative to not having enough workforce. The, 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 the unemployment rate and, and the number of people that are looking for jobs right now are is amazing. And people with disabilities in my prediction, my crystal ball, will be some of the people that fill a lot of those needed jobs to to uh, be the receptionist at that hotel, to be the person that helps carry the luggage up the stairs, to be the person that 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 that, that makes sure that that you get the uh, order that you need for your fast food delivery. That's going to be the, the, the issues. And, um, and, and, and we're seeing that now because that can't happen in overseas and that can't happen with the internet and that can't happen with a zoom call or or it can't happen virtually it has to happen face to face yeah yeah well and it seems to me that the more um accepting you are of that concept you know the more open you are to the process i know that in my local supermarket um you know the bag bagging staff um and the cart wranglers are all in you know we call them packaging engineers, right? But they help you get your your order passed and put together and everything. And it's over the years, I noticed how our community um, in our neighborhood, you know, they, they know these people's names. They've been aging with them. They see them. They're, you know, it, it's a very um, positive thing because one, it's ended that fear of being other and everybody's kind of figured it out right and it seems to be incredibly incredibly successful um a, a, a successful program in my neighborhood it's uh safeway albertson's and they have a you know a national structure for it and those uh that labor force is incredibly consistent they don't come and go and change i mean they seem like more consistent than the cashiers almost Yes, because when we come to the job, we, we don't care about what our neighbor said about us the night before. We leave all the drama at home. People with disabilities love to have a job. They love to work and they love to feel appreciated. Yeah. And they're not going to, to be looking at, a, at an iPhone and, 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 and seeing whether they're popular that day. They're going to make sure that you're saying hello to them and that they can greet you and bag your groceries, whatever they need to do. And that, that, tra that can transform to a variety of other jobs as well. And so that, that's it. The other part of the crystal ball, ball that I want to bring up is that we have to get a lot more people off these waiting lists and government has to realize that people with disabilities 
are not only a viable workforce, but they really should be involved in having the same rights and living in the same housing as, as, with dignity as other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and they're going to have to start figuring out how to clear the, the way for that. And in a time when we're totally just, you know, distressed over things like bullying and, and discriminatory practices and a variety of, 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 of genres. What we have to realize is that people with disabilities uh, are, are, are individuals that have, in fact, had a history of being uh, discriminated and had, had a history of, of being in need of housing and poverty and that they, they want to be part of a community and 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 the, and i think the more that the government realizes that that's going to happen uh the more we can do that and I, I i make an effort uh we're in 12 states i know all 12 governors and i talk to them all about what we're doing and they all uh, listen to what we're doing too so i think that's really important as well you know i was riveted by uh, and, and almost at the same time shamed by the notion that you brought up very quickly and succinctly about the Civil Rights Act never included this concept of disability. And I never thought of it until you mentioned, I was like, holy moly, so true, so true. And then you, you linked in this concept of social behavior, kindness, bullying, all that. That's a big part of the ecosystem for this part of our population. And so I really appreciate you bringing this forward because it's just been so fascinating. Hey, I warned you, my new friend, that this was going to go by fast and our time has flown by. Um, I have been riveted by this conversation. And for somebody who prides himself on thinking they know about this, um, you've really illuminated a lot of things that I hadn't put together. And so I'm super appreciative. Robert Stack, president and CEO of Community Options. Go to comop.org, that's comop.org, and you'll be able to learn about the work and the, the trajectory of the work that Community Options um, has done. 12 states, you're in 12 states, and that those are going across the country, right? It's not just in the, the North Atlantic. No, from from New York to, to to Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, to South Carolina, Tennessee, yeah, uh, Iowa, we're, we're all over the place. That's awesome. It's really really cool. You can learn a lot about their programming, their concepts, and I think too. And I, I keep going back to this, but the um, the historical change and and shift in how we have grappled with this issue of disability and advocacy and uh, living with dignity has been fascinating um, and, and we just really touched on it but robert you've been at the forefront of this and it's just been such a pleasure to to have you chat with us i hope you continue your work and then check back in with us love to thank you so much this has been wonderful it's been a lot of fun hey everybody we want to make sure that we shout give a shout out of gratitude to our presenting sponsors they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that support us day in and day out so we can have fabulous thought leaders like Robert Stack on today, making a huge difference in our world. Um, Robert, I got to really briefly tell you before our time's up and our producer cuts us off, um, I flunked an, an econ class uh, in, in, school, in college because the the essay that I had to write was a four hour essay timed essay as in during finals was about um, a hand and they use the word handicapped uh, situation and I ended up spending my four, four hours writing why handicapped was not the right word in the genesis of you know begging and cap in hand and all this stuff and um, I flunked that class because the professor was torqued at me uh, because I didn't. I schooled them on a piece of vocabulary, <laughs> but um, so that when you said the handicapped man, that has stuck in my brain for 40 plus years. Um, and I'm sure that professor never changed their vernacular. I'm sure of it, but you know, uh, that just is, it illuminates how we're all evolving and, and thanks to your good work, we're evolving. So it has been a joy to have you on and, and, uh, 
we we will definitely keep checking on your work and seeing what's going on. Um, I've had somebody write in during the live part of our show, which of course we're live, that says we need you in Rochester, New York. So there I just you go. Wanna... <laughs> Love to go. <laughs> I just want to end with that. Hey, everybody, as we end each and every episode, we like to leave with this message. And the message is this, to stay well so you can do well. See you again, everyone.